Well, thank you for expanding your world. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. Thank you for bringing life changers into your home. Thank you for staying connected. Thank you for being a part of this spiritual family, wherever you're joining me, wherever we're connecting together. God bless you. I thank God for you. I pray for you every day. I believe with you every day. I believe in you every day. I really do. I believe in you. I believe in what God's doing in your life. And last Sunday, I began a little teaching I called happy days. And um, I really believe we need some happy days. I need I believe that God's called us to experience some happy days. And I want you to experience true joy, and true happiness, which is God's idea. Happiness was never Satan's idea. Happiness is God's idea. Misery is un an unhappiness. That's Satan's idea. But happiness and joy and and fulfillment and total life satisfaction, that's God's idea. In fact, last Sunday, you remember when I started talking about happy days, I said there were three things that cause happiness in our lives. We started with these three things and I want to get into the fourth today. But the first one was happiness comes from knowing that you're forgiven. Romans chapter four, verse eight in the New Living Translation, he said, yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. What joy for those whose record, whose past, whose mistakes and sins and heartaches has all been cleared, has all been wiped away. What joy for those whose past has been wiped away, whose sin has been wiped away. Your record, your record has been cleared by Jesus. And that brings happiness. Secondly, we learned that happiness comes from the assurance that we're loved. John Chapter 15, verse nine, Jesus said, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you as the father has loved me. So have I loved you. And then he continues on in verse 11 and says, these things I have spoken to you, these things about his love, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. What things has he spoken to us that his joy may be in us? The things that he just spoke, which was starting in verse nine, as the father has loved me. I have also loved you. Stay in that. He says, abide in that. Abide in my love. Not don't try to manufacture your love. Abide in his. Just stay in his love, knowing that he loves you, knowing that he loves you as much as the father loves him. The father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Jesus has loved you as much as the father has loved him. It's just perfection. Perfect love casts out all fear, makes your faith work makes the gospel get spread, causes people to know that we are his disciples because of his love for us and our love for one another. Right. No matter what our differences are, we don't allow our differences to bring division. Right. We respect each other's differences. We respect each other's point of view. We have empathy. It's a part of love. It's a part of learning how to appreciate life and learning how to appreciate others. And the third thing we said that happiness comes from not condemning yourself. Romans chapter 14, verse 22, Paul said, happy is he that does not condemn himself. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. And condemnation is the greatest, one of the greatest tools of the enemy to rob you of happiness, to make you miserable, to make you beat yourself up. But there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Amen. Well, today I want to talk about another thing about happiness or that causes and produces happiness. And remember that all unhappiness started in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. And notice what happens in Genesis chapter three, verse one. Satan says, has God really said that you shouldn't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Has God really did God really say that? Has God do you really believe that? You see, this is what Satan does to separate us from joy, to separate us from true happiness, to separate us from true peace, because real peace and joy and happiness comes from believing what God said. And so notice the first thing that he tells and first thing he does to try to undermine, try to rob Eve 
of that joy, that peace, that happiness is by getting her to doubt what God said. When you believe what God said, if you believe in these words, he said, you'll have peace and joy. Peace and joy comes from believing. So when he got her to stop believing God's word, it was the beginning of the downfall of mankind. It was the beginning of his separation from God and misery and, un and unhappiness that comes from that separation from God. And really, if you could boil it down to one thing, it's, it's really that, that Adam and Eve were cast out of God's presence when they believed the lie and acted on that belief. Mistaken beliefs cause mistakes. Mistaken beliefs cause costly mistakes. That's why we got to focus on what we believe, because what we believe shapes how we live and how we choose and the decisions that we make. But this unhappiness started when they stopped believing what God said. They were separated from God's presence in verse verse eight and nine. God says Adam and Eve were walking at one point. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the Bible says the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees in the garden. And the Lord God said in verse nine, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? You see, they hid themselves from God's presence because of their shame. They hid themselves from God's presence and God's presence was they were separated from God's presence when they sinned. Now, Jesus brought us into God's presence and our individual sins don't separate us from God anymore. That's a myth. Jesus has washed away. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The sin that separated mankind from God was Adam and Eve's sin. And we were born into that. That's why when we're born again, we're born again into Christ. We're born again into God's presence. We're born again to, and never to be separated from God. Nothing will separate us from the love of God and nothing will separate us from God. And this is the secret to real happiness. And I'm really talking about this one point that the Christian life is a celebration of the miracle, the miraculous relationship that we get to have with God. We literally have a miraculous relationship with God. And the Christian life is a celebration of this relationship. And true happiness comes from true connection and intimacy with God, intimacy with God, connection, fellowship, intimacy with God. See, sin separated man from God and Adam and Eve's sin separated man from God. And as a result, they began because they were they began to live independent from God. They were miserable. They were unhappy in sorrow, multiplied sorrow. The Bible says is the result of Adam and Eve's separation from God. It's not so much the sin as much as the result of the sin was the separation between a holy, perfect God and now an unholy man. Jesus makes us righteous, right? So we're no longer separated from God. But the point when we're born again, but the point is, is that true happiness, real joy comes from relationship with God, that we're not living a life independent from him anymore. Independence from God is the cause of all unhappiness, it's the cause of all death. It's the cause of all all pain and suffering. Connection with God brings peace, connection with God. Dependence on God brings joy. It brings happiness. We'll talk more about that, but I really want to focus on this intimacy with God. You see, when we're connected with God, we're satisfied when we're aware of his presence. Sometimes we're not aware of his presence. His he's present. He's in us and we're in him. And even now, where two or three are gathered together in his name, there there he is. Jesus said, there I am in the midst of them. Wow. That awareness of his presence brings joy. So often we forget that he's with us. We think he's out there somewhere. We have the myth of separation, this illusion that we're separated from God. And when you're born again, you're no longer separated from God anymore. The awareness of that connection with God 
that ability to have intimacy with God, that brings joy, that brings happiness. That's the greatest happiness you'll ever find. Imagine meeting the most perfect person. I, how many people are praying and hoping for the right spouse, the best husband, the best wife, the best relationship. Imagine you finding the best of the best human beings on the face of the earth. If it could even be ranked like that, you find the number one best person in the universe. You would be the happiest person on earth. Well, guess what? You have found that he really has found you. We didn't even have to find him. He found us. We are in relationship now through the blood of Jesus. We're in relationship with the greatest, the most amazing, the most beautiful person in the universe. God himself, Jesus, how beautiful is the savior. We're connected when we realize this connection we have with him. It truly will satisfy you. Nothing else will completely satisfy you except God, his presence. And you know, your mistakes and your sins don't separate you anymore from God's presence because all of your sins have been washed away past, present and future. Anybody who doesn't believe that your future sins are passed away, none of your sins could be passed. None of your sins could be washed away if your future ones aren't washed away, because everything we've ever done was future to the Jesus that died on the cross 2000 years ago. All of our sins were future sins. We look at it like, oh, tomorrow I might do something. I, I might sin. I might make a mistake tomorrow and God will that'll separate me from God. No, because God's already been to your tomorrow. He's already been to your next week, next month, next year, next decade. He's been to your forever and back and washed it all away at one moment, one time. And it'll never. The Bible says he died once for all, once for all and once and for all. He never has to do it again. He never will do it again. It's never needed again. It was more than enough. That's why he said it is finished. He didn't say it's finished almost until you just get all the rest of your sin out of your life. No, it was finished then. It's finished now, just as it was then. Whew. Your awareness of that will change your life. Your awareness of that will bring you happiness beyond belief. The Song of Solomon. To show you how this intimacy, this that you can have this now. You have this now, but you can enjoy this now. This intimacy, this connection, Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse two, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. This is the bride talking about her groom. This is us talking about Jesus. May he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine. You see, wine has properties that heal, properties that bring temporary happiness, properties that wine has chemicals, has maybe that's the wrong word, but has the ingredients in it or is has within itself healing properties and the ability to make you forget some of your sorrow and pain. But he says your love is better than wine because wine or alcohol or however you want to look at it, what's in the natural has side effects. It has limitations, but God's love is better than that. Jesus love is better than that because it has no limitations. It has no end. It has no side effects that are negative. It has all positive side effects. Your love is better than wine. Listen to this verse in the Passion Translation. Let him smother me with kisses, his spirit kiss divine. So kind are your caresses. I drink them in like the like the sweetest wine. Whew. Let him smother me with his kisses, his spirit kiss divine. Look at that in the Message Bible, too. His words are kisses and his kisses words. Everything about him delights me. Or that's actually verse. Um, move on to let me show you something in uh, kiss me full of your mouth. Kiss me full on. Whew. 
That's, oh, that's a powerful verse. <laughs> but look at this in verse 16, Song of Solomon 16. In the New King James, his mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. Song of Solomon 5, verse 16 in the New King James. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. Whew. He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend. That's what Jesus is. In the Message Bible, in this verse, it says his words are kisses, his kisses, words. Everything about him delights me, thrills me through and through. That's my lover. That's my man. This is our savior. We began to talk about this. Last year, when the pandemic started, when we got into the summer, I started a teaching that just came to me just from God showing me more into himself, more giving me a better glimpse of who he really is. Talked about the beauty of Jesus. Our beautiful savior, he's altogether lovely. Verse 16 says he's altogether lovely. Everything about him delights me. This is the kind of relationship that we have the privilege of having. We don't cultivate it all the time. We don't remember and we're not, we're not aware of it all the time, but we have it all the time. And the more that we get our minds renewed to this union that we have with him, this closeness, this intimacy that we have with him, the more happiness, the more joy, the more love is going to flow through our lives into every relationship and every connection we ever have with people. This is this is the greatest. This is, everybody wants this. Everybody wants somebody like this in their life. Everybody wants this. Everybody wants the perfect lover. And Jesus is the perfect lover. If I can share this definition with you about intimacy for a moment, because I'm talking about intimacy with God. It means to take the risk, the word intimacy. It means to take the risk to be close enough to someone to allow them to step inside your personal boundaries, to take the risk to be close enough to someone to allow them to step inside your personal boundaries, inside the boundary that you don't let anybody else into. Intimacy means allowing somebody into that special, personal place that nobody, not everybody just doesn't have access to that. It's reserved for one who truly deserves that, who's earned that, who's worthy of that. There's none more worthy than Jesus. And he wants this kind of relationship with you. He offers this kind of relationship with you in Revelation 320. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come into him and I'll come and I'll dine with him and he with me. Think about that. That Jesus is standing at the door. He's not standing at the door and knocking so that if you open it up, he can show you all your sins. He can show you all your mistakes. He can shame you for your past. He says, open the door and I'm going to come in and I'm going to dine with you and you with me. Dine with him. That's you don't dine with somebody that you're not enjoying. You don't dine with some. He's not you don't say, hey, let's dine together. And then it it's nasty and negative and it's it's a moment to expose each other's sins and mistakes and shortcomings and failures. That's that's not when you dine with somebody, you're celebrating them. When you dine with some, he said, mm, I'm he's not standing knocking to take something from you, he's standing and knocking to give something to you, to bring something to you. The power of his presence. 
Jesus is saying, I want to come into the close place. I want to come into the secret place of your life. I want to come where the secrets are reserved for me and you. I want to be with you for him to want that of me, for him to want that of you is a miracle that he would even want that. It's a miracle to make us just stop and say hallelujah. Thank you, God. Wow. Amazed. It should amaze you that he wants this kind of closeness with you. Not only does he pay for it in his blood, not only does he provide for it, not only does he encourage us to partake of this, but he wants to, too. He wants this. You're wanted. You're desired by him. Boy, if we could get a hold of this, we we want to be liked by so many people. And yet he likes you. The ultimate source of true happiness is not found in how many people like you or your job or your Instagram posts or your social media. But the ultimate is to have the creator of the universe want that with you. He he doesn't he doesn't tolerate that with you. He wants that with you. He doesn't just kind of accommodate that with you. He wants that with you. You know, we don't deserve this kind of. We don't deserve to be desired like that. You know some stuff about you that isn't desirable. I know some stuff about me that's not desirable. There's some stuff about all of us that's not so desirable. And yet with all of that. He offers. He not only offers, but he's standing at the door. I wonder if all of this that has happened in the last 11 months or so was all to bring us to this moment, a moment where we could open up the door to intimacy with Jesus, to closeness, to this deep, affectionate relationship between you and your beautiful savior, between me and my beautiful savior. The greatest relationships that we can have with each other are the overflow of our relationship with Jesus. He doesn't say I stand at the door to point out your sins. He said, I'm coming and I'm bringing food with me. I'm coming. I'm I'm your grub hub. I'm your, you know, whatever else they, you know, these dining, you know, these delivery companies to bring food. I, Jesus, like I, I'm bringing room service. I'm coming and I'm bringing dinner with me. I'm going to dine with you and you with me. Wow. You think about a candlelight dinner with somebody. That's what he's offering. That's what he's made available to each one of us. How, how do we practically make this work in our lives? Look at look at let me show you. Go with me over here to um, Luke, chapter 19, Luke, chapter 19. Verse one, Luke, chapter 19, verse one, he entered Jericho and was passing through. And he says there was a man says, and there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was short. He was small in stature. It just means he was short. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him. For he was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to this place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry up and come down for today. I must stay at your house. 
Boy, you see why we're not just having church in the temple. It's both in the temple and from house to house. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, get down from that tree because today I must stay. I must stay at your house. And the Bible says, and he hurried and came down and received him gladly, received him joyfully, received him happily. I want you to see how powerful this is. First of all, that Jesus noticed him. You know, Jesus saw him in the tree and he noticed him. And it's something that we shared, talked about earlier in the week, I think. Through our fast from wrong thinking, which is still going, you can go to fastfromwrongthinking.com if you're not already getting that daily breakthrough devotional to renew our minds and to truly break the mentalities of failure and mistaken belief system that has defeated us. We're breaking those mentalities. But one of those mentalities is that you're not that important. That's a mentality that needs to be broken. And it says Jesus looked up and saw Zacchaeus and he said, Zacchaeus, he looked up and Zacchaeus was in the tree. And he said to him, he noticed him. I want you to hear this. God notices you. He recognizes you. He's looking at you and he's speaking to you. Did you hear me? He notices you. He recognizes you. He's looking at you and he's speaking to you. He notices you. He recognizes you. He look, he's looking at you and he's speaking to you. He notices you. He recognizes you. He's looking at you and he's speaking to you. And you know what he's speaking? I got to stay at your house. I'm coming over. I'm coming. I want to be with you. I want to spend time with you. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. This is the first thing that shows the effect, the impact of Zacchaeus realizing that Jesus noticed him. Jesus recognized him, called him by name. Jesus looked at him. Jesus spoke to him. Jesus told him, I want to come to your house. And it, the Bible says Zacchaeus received him with joy. One translation says joyfully, gladly, happily. It's all the same. You know what it means to be glad, to be happy, to have joy. Is this this marked this man's life forever? In fact, if I could put it to you this way. At first, when Zacchaeus goes up to gets into the tree to see if Jesus to see what Jesus looks like when he's passing by, Zacchaeus shows curiosity. Some of us need to get curious. We need to get curious. We need to be a little more interested in what Jesus looks like, what he's saying, what he wants for us. We need to get more curious. We need to be more interested in this great savior. We need to be willing to be inconvenienced. He went up in a tree. He was willing to be embarrassed. He was already short. He has to go up into a tree to look at Jesus, to see Jesus. He's willing to be embarrassed. Like we have to get to a place where we're unembarrassable, where we're unembarrassable. Whatever God asks us to do in this case, Zacchaeus, he's, he's willing to climb a tree. That was the reason why that was frowned upon by most people at the time, because it was considered something that only animals do. Animals climb up trees. Human beings don't. But Zacchaeus didn't care what it made him, what it made him look like. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. You know what Jesus looks like is far greater and worth far more than whatever embarrassment you look like by coming to church or by lifting your hands or by giving your tithe or by calling yourself a believer, calling yourself a Christian, being obedient to God. That may 
that may not look good to others, may not look good to this world system, this world's culture. Who cares? Why does their opinion mean anything to you when you have the approval and the love of Jesus? Anybody else's opinion shouldn't matter, including your own. Whew. You know, Jesus is calling us to this intimacy. And it says in Isaiah. Chapter 43, verse one, I am your I am your redeemer and I've called you by name. I am your redeemer. And I've called you by name. Don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm your redeemer. I've called you by name. You're mine. Don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm your redeemer. I know your name. I've called you. You're mine. I'm yours. You're mine. This is Christianity. It's not religion. It's Christianity. This is real Christianity we're talking about here. He calls you by name Zacchaeus. They never had a conversation. They never even met before. Oh, except when God made Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus recognizes him, notices him, recognizes him, speaks to him, looks at him. He notices you. Remember the woman, the issue of blood, realizing she could not go unnoticed. I think in Luke chapter eight, verse 47, it says, then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. She told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed, seeing that she could not go unnoticed. I want you to be encouraged today. There's not one person watching right now. Who has gone unnoticed. By Jesus, he noticed you. He recognizes you. He looks at you. He speaks to you. He wants to come to you, spend time with you. I'm not just talking about spending time in the morning with God. That's beautiful and it's vital. And I enjoy that. But I'm talking about being able to talk to him at all times, at any time, anywhere about anything. That's intimacy to talk to him anytime, anywhere about anything, knowing that you're safe and knowing that he won't judge you, he won't condemn you, he won't criticize you. Can you could we get to the place where we could say today? He notices me. I will never go unnoticed by God another day in my life. He recognizes me, calls me by name. Hey, Zacchaeus. He speaks to me. Hey, I want to come over. I must stay. It's a must for God. It's a must to Jesus. It's a must. Think about it. There are some things that are kind of important to do. There are some things that are really important to do. And then there's just some things you must do. And you know what? You're on Jesus must list. You're on his must list. I must look at that. He says to Zacchaeus, he doesn't say, I should probably come over. Maybe one day I'll come over. Look at what he says there. I must come to your house. I must stay at your house. Not only is he coming, he's staying. And notice how this impacts Zacchaeus. He received him gladly. You see. This intimacy, this awareness that Jesus noticed him, that Jesus recognized him, that Jesus spoke to him, that Jesus wanted to come to him. 
It caused Zacchaeus to be glad. It made this man happy. It was the intimacy. It was the connection. It was the being noticed, being recognized, being spoken to, being desired, being on Jesus must list. You know, there are some things people have on their. Their bucket list. Oh, I'd love to do this before I die. I'd love to do this before I die again. I want to remind you again. I want to say to you, you're on Jesus must list. It's not even a bucket list. It's so much greater than that. It's not. Well, hopefully, maybe before too long, I get that done. I must stay. I'm not coming until you make another mistake. I'm coming to stay. I'm not just coming to your life to your life on Sunday. I'm staying. I must stay at your house. Whew. Boy, there's something Jesus is wanting to do. He wants to, he wants to come and spend time at your house. He's not coming to your house to make sure that you've cleaned it all up. He's not coming to your house to make sure that you got everything neat and tidy. He's not coming to your house to make sure that you prepared a good meal for him. He's bringing dinner with him. He's bringing the food. He's bringing the love. He's bringing the joy. He's bringing the presence. He's bringing the power. He's bringing the bread. He's bring, bringing the wine. He's bringing the happiness. He's bringing the peace. He's bringing the joy. He's bringing the love. He's bringing everything with him. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? He that did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Oh, I want you to get this. This changed this personal connection with Jesus. It changed Zacchaeus's relationships in every way. Notice here it changed his relationship with himself. First of all, this intimate relationship with Jesus changed Zacchaeus's relationship with himself. He's finally glad. This was a miserable man tax collector. Everybody hated him. Now he's glad you see this relationship with Jesus. It changed Zacchaeus's relationship. With himself, you know, you have to learn to live with yourself and be glad. You have to learn to accept yourself and be happy. You have to learn to that Jesus doesn't come to Zacchaeus's house with this list. You better change this, this and this before I come. He just comes as is. And when they saw it, they began to grumble, saying he's gone to be with this, this evil guy, this sinner. And then Zacchaeus stopped and he said to the Lord, verse eight, behold, Lord, half of my possessions I'm given to the poor. So notice his this intimate relationship with Jesus, which Jesus initiated it. You don't have to strive for this. This is yours now. This relationship is yours now. Jesus notices you. Number one, Jesus recognizes you. Number two, calls you by name, has a specific relationship between him and you personally. He's speaking to you. And he is desiring you and you're on his must list. It made Zacchaeus happy in his relationship with himself. This relationship with Jesus has made him content with his relationship with himself. And then it made him it changed his relationship with money. It changed his relationship with himself. This intimacy with Jesus changed his relationship with himself. He was happy now. Changed his relationship with his money. He was generous now. Half of my possessions I'm given to the poor. And it changed his relationship with others. It says in verse eight at the end of the verse, if I've defrauded anyone, anything, I'm going to pay them back four times as much. You see, I want you to see this beautiful 
intimacy with Jesus, this beautiful Savior, when you realize he notices you, when you realize he recognizes you, when you realize he's speaking to you, when you realize you're on his must list, he wants you, he desires you, it'll change your relationship with yourself. You'll be happy. It'll change your relationship with money. You'll be generous and it'll change your relationship with people. If I wronged anybody, I'm going to pay him back. I'm going to I'm going to fix it. Would you allow this savior we get to call our beautiful savior, our best friend? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. Would you allow this closeness? Would you just embrace and accept that he notices you embrace and accept that he recognizes you personally? Embrace and accept that he is talking to you right now with kindness and love and compassion and understanding. And would you embrace today that he has you on his must list? He really desires you. He really wants you because it'll change your relationship with yourself. You find true happiness. It'll change your relationship with money. You'll be generous. He's given half of everything he has. He said, I'm giving halfway. He's not debating about the tithe. He's not asking, is the tithe, you know, net or gross? <laughs> He's like half of everything I have. I'm giving it away. Changed his relationship with money and changed his relationship with people. I'm going to fix whatever I've done to somebody, whatever wrong I've done to somebody, I'm going to make it up to them. Let your beautiful Savior's relationship with you, let it draw you into this closeness. This can talk to him about anything, anytime, anywhere about anything. That's what you have been given. That's what you've been given by Jesus. But there are some right now that are watching. Maybe you've never received him as your savior and Lord. Maybe you're still in the tree, curious, and you haven't been born again yet. Now's your moment. Let's get born again. If you haven't been, what does that mean? It means God takes out your old heart and gives you a new one, takes out your old spirit, gives you a brand new one. Our mind is still the same, but we need our mind renewed day by day. That's a journey and that's the journey we're all going to be on together. But it starts with being born again. How? By simply believing in Jesus Christ to Savior and Lord. Would you say this out loud? Just pray this out loud. Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my Savior and Lord. From this moment forward, I am forgiven. I'm washed by your blood. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. I am now a child of God. Boy, if you just prayed that prayer, all of heaven is rejoicing. All of heaven is singing. All of heaven is celebrating you because Jesus noticed you. Jesus recognized you. Jesus is speaking to you and Jesus wants you. You're on his must list. And I congratulate you for making that decision. Let us know so we can help you in this journey, in this daily walk with God and stay connected now and everybody together. Say this. Jesus notices me. Say this. Jesus notices me. Jesus recognizes me. Jesus is my redeemer. He calls me by name. I'm his and he's mine. I'm on his must list. He is speaking to me now and I receive it all in Jesus name. Now go be happy because that's what you get to be now that you have this awareness of his closeness and his intimacy. What a gift. And I'll see you at our next service. God bless.